students of economics, geography, sociology or politics, you're clearly interested in those big ideas that are central to an understanding of society. Perhaps you're interested in solving the problems of poverty or minimizing inequality. Maybe you're concerned about climate change, mass migration, globalization, or perhaps the politics of change. Now these issues present enormous challenges and opportunities for a new generation of leaders, but there's simply no way to handle these challenges without some understanding of statistical methods. The best ideas often come from some insight into the way the world works, and the insights into the way the world works quite often come from understanding numbers. I mean, to have a feeling about data, how to analyze data, I think everybody has to do that. And therefore statistics, and of course in statistics, is the best foundation for getting some appreciation of how to go about doing that. Boring? Boring? Good heavens no. I think it's one of the most interesting things somebody can do. You can't really understand people in any depth on any aggregate basis without a reasonable understanding of statistics. You don't have to be a statistician, but you have to understand the basics. This series of films will reveal insights that can only be discerned using statistics. Learning statistics may take some effort, but the rewards are enormous. When I started doing statistics at university, yes, it was hard, but I think anything that's worth doing tends to be hard first. You have to go through the challenge of working something out and understanding how it works. Our first film focuses on descriptive statistics. In particular, we'll look at a few interesting issues in the social sciences which cover the main techniques used to present data, focusing on what these techniques tell you and what they don't tell you. Do politicians seek to maximise the welfare of the electorate or their own welfare? There's a strong case for saying that at least part of their attention is devoted to their own welfare. People in marginal constituencies, one the government needs to win if they're to retain power at the next election, might be favoured more than people in non-marginals in order to influence voting behaviour of those people where the votes are thought to matter more. For example, researchers look to see if the number of acute hospital beds per head of population is higher in the marginal constituencies. Let's have a look at the evidence using a very common form of presentation of data that we call the bar chart. The bar chart indeed shows that there are more acute hospitals per head of population in marginal constituencies. The figure plots the mean number of hospitals per 1 million people within a 30 kilometer radius of the centroid of a political constituency against the winning margin in 1997 of the governing party that was then Labour. When Labour is not the winning party, the margin is the negative of the difference between the winning party, usually Conservative, and the next closest party. The margin is denoted as X. So for example the fourth bar can be read as X is between 0 and 5%. The tallest bars tend to cluster around the more marginal constituencies. Notice that the vertical axis doesn't begin at 0 but at 3 hospitals per million of population. The effect of starting the bar there is to emphasise the differences in acute hospital provision. Now we're not looking at this evidence to make some political point. The purpose of looking at the data is to illustrate the power of the bar chart to illuminate statistical information. Sometimes bar charts illuminate, sometimes they're downright misleading. A Lib Dem Conservative government raised value-added tax and produced a bar chart claiming that it showed the tax to be progressive. That is to say, the higher income groups pay more than the lower income groups as a proportion of their income. The opposite is in fact true. It's a regressive tax. 
it affects the lower incomes proportionately more than the higher income groups. Let's first of all make sure that we're clear what we mean by regressiveness and then we'll turn to the bar chart and show you how it's designed to mislead. The table is illustrative data, but data like this is valuable to illustrate a principle. Imagine a society where as annual income rises, more tax is paid. You can see this illustrated in the first two columns of the table. When income doubles from 10 to 20,000, tax paid rises from 2,000 to 3,000 pounds. The higher income person pays more tax. But now look at column three. Tax paid by the lower income person is a higher proportion of income, 20%, as against 15% for the higher earner. That's because as income rises, the extra tax paid on the additional pound, the marginal tax rate, is falling. Such a system is called a regressive tax system because as income rises, the proportion of income paid in tax falls. Alternatively expressed, as income rises, the marginal tax rate declines. A progressive tax system might look like the second table. Not only does a rise in income lead to more tax being paid, but a higher proportion of income is paid in tax. That is, the marginal tax rate is rising. Not all the price of the petrol goes to the petrol companies. Much of it is tax. Some a specific duty on petrol, some of it value-added tax. Now, whether I'm rich or poor, if I put 70 pounds worth of petrol into the tank, it's going to cost me 70 pounds. But that 70 pounds is a larger part of a smaller income than of a larger income. So the effect of the tax is actually regressive. Now look at the bar chart, which purports to show how as income rises, more value-added tax is paid by higher income groups because they have a higher expenditure. This is the effect of a VAT rise from 17.5 to 20% on households at different income levels. Is this true, that higher income groups will pay more VAT? Absolutely. The bar chart shows this very clearly. Is the tax progressive? Absolutely not. The higher income groups pay more of that, but as a proportion of their income, they pay less. That is by nature regressive. A bar chart can present information in a very powerful way. There was a study done recently in the States looking at the distribution of wealth a Harvard business professor and a behavioral economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth is distributed in the United States. Most thought that it's more balanced than it actually is. Asked to choose their ideal distribution of wealth, 92% of these people picked one that was even more equitable. Let's look at the stacked bar chart to see how this information is conveyed. The bars are the same length this time because we're looking at proportions, so in each case we look at the distribution of all 100% of wealth. We've lost the precision that we would have in a table. It's difficult to see exactly what percentage is owned by, say, the top 20% of wealth holders, but this form of presentation gives a very powerful impression of the difference between what the distribution is, what people think it is, and what people think it should be. The distribution of wealth is a very important topic in the social sciences, so we'll be returning to this issue in several later films. All societies have a mix of different kinds of output to satisfy needs. Any society will produce some agricultural goods, some manufactured products, some services, but the proportions of services to manufacturing to agriculture will vary considerably between countries. A part of the explanation for that 
is in the nature of their resources. Some countries are particularly suited to agriculture, they produce a lot of it and then export some of it to pay for manufactured imports. But there's something else that goes on as well. That is that over time demand tends to change. So you find that countries will often, when they're less developed, produce lots of agricultural products, less manufactured products and very few services. As they develop, they begin to shrink their agricultural sector and people move more into the towns and the manufacturing sector grows. But when we reach a high level of income, it's the demand for services which grows, so manufacturing output begins to fall. A useful way to present this information is via a pie chart. We'll look at three such charts to show the proportions of output represented by agriculture, manufacturing and services in three different economies. The first is the UK. Each slice of the pie represents a sector. Notice how powerfully the diagram represents the relative proportions of output. The UK is an advanced economy. Notice how relatively tiny the agricultural sector is. Now look at China. Notice the pie chart covers the same area as that for the UK. Whatever the size of the economy, each one has an output level of 100%. The Chinese economy has grown very rapidly in recent years. So although agricultural output is huge, it has shrunk relative to its manufacturing sector. Finally, consider Sierra Leone, a relatively less developed economy. The pie chart is the same size as for the UK and China, despite the fact that it's a small economy. The pie chart emphasizes the different proportions of output. Agriculture is easily the biggest sector here. If you're nervous about percentages, we devote a whole film to the topic later in the series. We live in a world of rising prices, sometimes more slowly, sometimes more quickly. A few might even fall. The general level of prices is tending to rise. This we call inflation. To define it another way, over time, we have a fall in the value of money. In our later program, we'll look at how we can use our knowledge of statistics to calculate inflation rates. But for now, let's look at how to present inflation data by the use of a graph. Rates of inflation vary over time. Sometimes it's just a few percentage points each year, and at other times, so much more. A graph is a very common device for the presentation of data. Here, we have UK data from 1990 to 2010 showing the annual percentage change in prices. The first graph has up the vertical axis annual percentage change of prices. The horizontal axis shows the years from 1990 to 2010. Note that all the changes are positive. There was inflation every year, but the rate of increase varied greatly. Now let's look at the second graph. This country also has a continually rising price level, but the variations appear much smaller. The graph is much flatter. Do you have any idea which country this second country might be? Well, it's the UK again, and over exactly the same time period. The vertical scale is different. Changing the scale gives a quite different impression of UK inflation variability. Always read the axes very carefully when interpreting a graph. Do you see a, a, a close link between uh, the level of income that people enjoy and their happiness? Uh, as people's incomes rise, uh, does their happiness rise alongside of it? Well, you know, it's a controversial area, as you indicated. I think the newest research in that area generally show two things. One, that richer countries are happier on the average than poorer countries, and that richer people in the same country are on the average happier than poorer people in that country. And these results are kind of consistent with each other. So I think the most latest research, I think, has questioned the questioning of whether there's a link between happiness and income. You know, it's not a perfect link by any means. We all know quite wealthy people who are really miserable. 
um, and so on. And uh, people are not wealthy who are poor who are quite content. So there's a lot of deviations. But I think on, as an average, as a statistical relation, yes, I am confident that the data show a positive relationship between happiness and income. I do see no reason why that should change as average incomes around the world rise. Well, it gets weaker. I mean, if you're going from a level of income where you can hardly survive to a level of income where your survival is assured, clearly that has a significant effect on happiness. Everybody has always agreed to that. So that effect isn't going to be as large when you go from an income of, let's say, 50,000 a year to 60,000 or 100,000, 110,000. Those effects are going to get smaller but I think it's gonna be positive, nevertheless. Let's sketch the relationship between income and reported happiness based on data from many countries. Here, we use sketches, not graphs. The first sketch shows the relationship between income and what people report to be their level of happiness. As income rises, happiness tends to increase but not by as much at higher income levels. But now look at the second sketch, where we have the same information, but this time the horizontal axis has a log scale. If you're not familiar with logs, the basic idea is quite simple. The log scale plots proportionate changes. So on the first graph, an increase in income from say twenty to forty thousand dollars is the same distance as from forty to sixty thousand dollars, both being a twenty thousand dollar rise in income. But on the second graph, a rise from twenty to forty thousand dollars is plotted as the same as an increase from forty to eighty thousand dollars, because in each case this would represent a doubling of income. Now the relationship appears more linear. As incomes rise, reported happiness goes on rising by as much when we focus on proportionate changes rather than absolute changes. Neither sketch shows the right way to present the data, but seeing information presented in a different way helps us to reach a view, provided that we're clear how to interpret it. Even when we've examined the data, we won't always be able to agree about everything. Even leading academics disagree about some issues. But our differences are likely to be less, and we'll certainly be better informed and able to make better judgments. But we can do much more than we've done so far. We'll be able to make inferences, draw conclusions that take us beyond the data. And this is the kind of thing we'll be doing many times over in the coming films. A knowledge of statistics is pretty fundamental to being a good citizen in the world we live in today. We're bombarded by numbers from all directions, trying to persuade us to buy something or believe something that a politician is saying, or to take some action. But unless you've got some facility to understand that, you've got no way of judging whether this bombard of numbers has actually got any meaning or not, or it's someone just trying to change your mind. So you're at sea. So Every little bit of statistics you know is going to help you make better choices in your life.